Good afternoon, Roy Oppenheim here. How are you? This is our 21st. I said last week was our 21st, but this is our 21st uh, Zoom at noon, uh, sponsored by both our law firm and our title comp company, Oppenheim Law and Western Title. And I want to thank uh, everyone who's always uh, helpful in, in participating in, in, in these events. Uh, this particular week, we're going to be talking about, of course, the up weekly economic update, our pandemic update, and of course, uh, we're going to be talking about COVID-19. Is it sa safe and social? Uh, how do we manage those two diametrically op opposed issues? And we have a wonderful special guest I'll be introducing shortly. For those of you who are new at this, uh, this is an interactive process. We ask you to ask questions. The topics themselves are interactive. Uh, for example, this week was requested by, by some of our folks to talk about you know, how do we actually try and go out at night and, and do the things that are fun at the same time, stay safe, and, and what are the legal implications with, with all of that. Our firm went through the last economic crisis. Uh, we were founded in 1989, both by my wife, Ellen Polowski, and, and myself. And uh, we've been uh, around for, for over, over 30 years. And um, next page, thank you. And I, I want to now introduce my team that I was going to just do a minute ago, besides myself and Ellen, as I mentioned, Jeff Sherman, my partner, Mia Singh, our senior associate, Paula Vagara, who's of counsel and helped prepare these presentations, and Sarah Spurlock, who um, is, um, I'd like to tell you a little about her because she's absolutely fascinating. Sarah uh, has worked uh, with the city of Fort Lauderdale since January of 2018. She's a nighttime economy manager. She serves as a liaison between the city and the hospitality and nightlife industry in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, the night uh, office promotes social order, safety, and enhanced service provisions to all those who work, play, and live after 5 p.m., which means, of course, uh, trying to uh, create as much cultural activity in, in the city and in the community as possible. And Sarah has worked in local government for over 20 years. Can we just uh, put Sarah on for a second so Sarah can, can say hello to everyone? Is that possible? Let's see. Sarah, are you there? I'm here. Can you? I guess you can't see me. Yeah, we can see you great. Thank, thank you so much for joining us. This should be a really fascinating discussion. Uh, and, I, and I even saw on the Sun, Sun Sentinel this morning, there's a, there's a front page story about what we're talking about today. So we, we couldn't have been, been more, more timely. Um, last week, Sarah, uh, we talked about the consequences of COVID-19 on, on real estate, specifically its impact that we're gonna have on the impeding foreclosure and eviction crisis. And the question isn't uh, if there's gonna be a foreclosure and eviction crisis, the only question is, when is that crisis going to occur? How is it going to manifest itself? And we talked about last week that it looks like there'll first be an eviction crisis, which will almost like create a, a domino effect into a foreclosure crisis. And, and when that happens and how that happens uh, will be uh, soon, soon for us to, to all figure out. This week, however, we're going to be talking about with you how to be safe and social during the, uh, the pandemic. <laughs> Uh, next uh, slide, please. The weekly economic update. Um, for those of you who do get the New York Times, this was a quite remarkable headline. Um, as we can see from the chart, uh, the gross domestic product literally fell by some 30 some odd pages. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, and we can see in depth a little bit. We can see here what, what how the GDP uh, or GMP has, has worked over, actually the GDP has, uh, evolved over the years and the red is obviously the down and as yes, the good news is there's been more ups and downs over the past uh, 50 years, 70 years, but the reality is we've never seen a decline like we're currently suffering in the history of this country or, or any, any civilized country uh, uh, in, in the world. So this is, this is a, a remarkable decline in, in, in one quarter. Uh, I, I want to remind everyone that this is interactive. If there are questions that come to mind, please ask them as we go through these slides and we'll get back to them. Uh, this is a fascinating slide. We're seeing that, that personal income actually has grown uh, by over 5% through the government bailout and the economic stimulus packages while the gross domestic product has dropped. And we've never seen such a disparate uh, view of, of the, that red line going down and the blue line going, going up right, right here um, as we can... Uh, so there you go, it's, it, it's quite remarkable. We haven't, even during the 08 crisis, we saw the two actually go in tandem. And, and here that's what's so remarkable that this is an experiment, an economic and social experiment of trying to, to keep the economy afloat by just propping up personal income. The problem is, is that it cannot remain that way. 
and that the two are going to converge probably back to where we were in 08 and, and have a crisis of, of, of that type as, as we proceed. Next slide. Uh, in terms of unemployment benefits, we're seeing here that um, if we look at what the unemployment benefits are doing, they're actually keeping income at around eight, nine hundred dollars a month for, 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 av for the average person. And that's at hundred percent benefits. If we dropped it to 70 percent, it dropped around six, seven hundred dollars. And if we removed all benefits on the third slide, we're seeing that income drops to around two hundred and fifty, three hundred dollars a week because so many people are, are, are unemployed right now. Um, next slide. Thank you. Let's go over the pandemic because this will relate both to the economics and to what Sarah is going to be talking about. As we all know, Florida is still a hot spot. Things have leveled off a little bit. The death rates have come down. The number of cases we're not sure about because it's, we're a week behind, but there's a suggestion that the cases have leveled off in part because of the curfews, in part because of the closings of, of restaurants and bars. And, and of course, that's, that's the issue. And then we're seeing all the other states that, that also are having hot spots, including states that previously didn't, didn't have issues. It, and it's spreading to rural areas also in the United States. Uh, number of known cases is doubling every month in Florida. Hopefully we're going to see a, a leveling off now, uh, but there has been a, a remarkable increase over the past uh, 90 days. Uh, the good news is that, that there are a number of vaccines that are in the process of, 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 of coming through. We're not sure how effective they're going to be. There are 140 in preclinical pre trials, then there are 18 in phase one, there are 12 in phase two, six in phase three, and the one approved one I'm not very familiar with, but it's only for limited use. But it's the six that, that people are betting on. And if you look at the logos, you'll be familiar with many of those names. It's Moderna and, then, and you have uh, Cambridge, uh, Oxford University, as, as well as other, other folks that are, that are intimately involved with this. Uh, obviously, uh, the current recommendations still, still remain about face masks, social distancing, constant hand washing. And, and, and now the new thing is also to cover your eyes and sometimes still wear gloves. And we're going to talk about that in the context of, of restaurants. Um, so Sarah, let, let's get you on board if we can. And, and let's just go back to one slide if we can. So, so Sarah, well, welcome aboard. Thank you so much for joining us uh, at our 21st uh, Zoom at noon. Um, I heard you first, uh, you know, it was on the local NPR affiliate. It was a, a great piece on, uh, on your position and what you're doing for the city of Fort Loyal. So first, just describe what, what your job really is. I thought that was fascinating. So thank you for um, inviting me to this. And again, my name is Sarah Spurlock. I'm the city of Fort Lauderdale's nighttime economy manager. The position was created after a study was done by a group called Responsible Hospitality Institute uh, back in 2016. And they part of their recommendation was to hire a nighttime economy manager. And that would be a person that looks after the city at night. Um, this is a, a kind of a growing phenomenon. Uh, there's eight of us here in the United States but there's probably 40-ish, 50 um, positions like mine all around the world. The position started in Amsterdam, actually. And basically, they're just, it's a, it's a focus and a realization, um, a recognition that just as much happens at night as happens during the day, um, especially in urban cities. And because we're living in a 24-hour world now, um, it's even more so. And folks, when they're looking for some place to live, when they're looking for some place to work and they wanna be in an urban environment, they pay a lot of attention to what happens at night. Um, that They have the amenities, that they're able to walk around at night safely and do all kinds of things at night that, they, that they've only been able to do during the day traditionally. So my- And, and, why, and I'm just curious why you think the night promotes those kinds of activities? I, and maybe it's a silly question, but I'm curious since you've probably studied that. Well, it, it, people don't just work nine to five anymore. So you have folks that work uh, maybe 3 p.m. to, to midnight. Um, you have folks that work in the, in the graveyard shift. So they're looking for um, ways to be able to do their, their life, their day-to-day -day life um, at, at any time of the day. Um, it, it, going to the dentist from the hours of nine to five is not always a realistic possibility for a lot of folks. So wouldn't it be great if I could go to the dentist at eight? Wouldn't it be great if I could go and buy a pair of jeans at 10 o'clock at night? Uh, wouldn't it be great if I could take my kid to the library after we eat dinner? So th there's a lot happening at night. Um, 
mostly it's a that's when creative things happen um, music art uh, is especially lively at night and those things are particularly important in an urban type environment right so for, so for, <clears throat> so from an anthropological perspective I mean, what we're saying is that the night promotes really the enrichment of, of, of cultural life in a, in a community is what it sounds like yes sociability creativity uh, that's that has its um, primary base at night. Very, very interesting. So, so let's talk about uh, this headline today in the Sun Sentinel, which talks about getting rid of the curfew, but expanding uh, enforcement, code enforcement, to make sure that restaurants are complying with their set hours as well as their social distancing rules. I mean, it seems like they're almost like saying two different things. Sure, you can go out, but you can't go anywhere. So let, let's talk about that. Yeah, so what, what I have found um, when we first reopened back in May, that the issue, we, we were having issues with some, with some restaurants. Um, they, they weren't abiding by the rules. It's in the hospitality industry when it is your nature to be um, hospitable and friendly and not to have to enforce things, um, it's, it's very difficult. So we had a lot of issues right at the beginning with um, them abiding by the 50% rule, abiding by the mask rule, abiding by the social distancing rule. So we, um, after a few weeks of this and a, and a tremendous spike in cases, we cracked down on our enforcement and we started shutting places down. And then the county implemented their fine policy that you know the second violation you can be shut down for up to four days you can be fined fifteen thousand dollars and within a couple few weeks we the the hospitality industry really stepped up and got in line and now in my opinion the hospitality industry is not the issue the issue is the vacation rentals and the after hour parties so when you close the restaurants at 10, um, they still want some place to go. Folks, especially young people, still want some place to go. So people are renting out vacation rentals and having big parties. So that is, there has been a definite shift in our enforcement. So getting rid of the, um, the curfew, I think might be useful because then we can keep folks at establishments at venues where there's um, more regulation, um, there's more safeguards in place than at a vacation rental where we have, where there's very little control. But aren't some of these venues still required to close by a certain time? But, well, yes, under the, under right now, yes, the curfew's at 10 and you have to be home by 11. So yes, they have to have, all, all customers need to be out by 10. Right, so now uh, without a curfew, they still have to be out by 10, but they can still go to a vacation rental after that or go yeah. to a parking lot. Yeah. So it, 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 it's gonna be tricky, but I, I understand from a personal rights and from a legal perspective, we can't have these constant curfews telling people for extended periods of time that they can't go out. I mean, there needs to be a compelling reason that we can exercise that compelling reason from a governmental perspective by saying, okay, we're gonna narrow the times that the establishments are gonna be open. That doesn't inhibit my constitutional, my legal rights to be able to travel freely. And so I think there's this balance between our legal rights and, and what the state is trying to achieve and the state's trying to achieve to get the COVID, the COVID rate down, but we can get the rate down, uh, not by being as extreme and, and being more narrow in, in our focus. So I think there's a balance there. And there are people who just don't like the idea that they're being told they have to stay home. It's just not fair and it's not right. It's not constitutional. We have some questions, let's start going through them. Does Sarah think that the protocols in place now will remain in the foreseeable future? Can she please explain those, those protocols? So uh, again, I work for the city of Fort Lauderdale and the protocols are being put in place by Broward County. So um, because I don't have a crystal ball, I don't know exactly what the county's gonna be doing, but their, their mindset um, is that until the numbers get go down, the protocols will stay in place. And those protocols are that everyone, um, if you're inside of a restaurant or a retail store or inside of any establishment, you need to be wearing a mask. Um, you can take off your mask once you sit down at the table to eat, but if you're going to go to the restroom, you need to put your mask back on to go to the restroom. 
So let's um, talk about a bar. So, so, so how about a bar? I mean, you can't go to a bar. Our bars are closed. Okay, gotcha. Bars it's are closed. Camp. Yeah, it's like a South Florida is like a different world from the rest of Florida. Um, we, for some reason, we are the epicenter of the epicenter, and um, the, the, most of the cases are are down here in in um, West Palm, Fort Lauderdale, and Miami. So we have much stricter rules than the rest of Florida. Let me ask a silly question. Someone had suggested, why don't we just lower the decibel level that is permitted in terms of music so that people don't have to speak so closely to each other to hear each other? Because if you have a high decibel level for music, by definition, you have to be close. Now, I know that may create you know, forms of socialization, but it also creates causes of the direct contact of the disease. And so the loud noise, loud music is a direct relationship to the spread of the disease. And so the question is, why aren't we focusing on, on targeting those issues? Like you got to keep your noise up. You got to have better acoustics. If it's too much people talking, you got to bring, you know, change your acoustics. I mean, I haven't seen any any of that. Yeah, that I, I think that's a very good point. Actually, um, it would be more relevant um, in a bar situation. So, it, in my mind, when you're going out to dinner, you're going out to dinner with your folks. It's your family, your friends, and you're at a table, and your that's really the, your only social group for the evening um if if it's going to pass between folks in at your table i think that's going to happen whether the music is loud or not in a bar situation where you might be mingling um and so you're not just sticking with your group of people but you're going all over the place and you're talking to people in the whole venue then the loud music becomes more of an issue because then you're not just spreading it in your own little group. You're now potentially spreading it to everybody in the bar. But I, I, that's a very good point. So, uh, let's talk, we, we were talking earlier about what percentage of restaurants and bars are gonna likely make it and what kinds of restaurants and bars will make it and which ones are just aren't going to. Can you go over those numbers? Cause I thought they were staggering. Yeah, so um, Yelp put out a report um, last week for uh, for the second quarter of 2020 and um, let me pull up those numbers and um for places according to their their status on yelp um if the places that are closed um for restaurants permanent closures are at 60 percent temporary closures at 40 percent uh, shopping and retail 48 percent are permanently closed 52 percent temporarily closed Bars and nightlife, 45% uh, are permanently closed, 55% are temporarily closed. Um, not, not every state has obviously the same closure protocols that we do. Um, so my guess is that our numbers uh, were more closed than other places. Um, so I, my guess would be that our numbers are, are higher for permanent closures. Yeah. You know, when we started the Zoom at noon, we were talking about literally an existential event for small businesses, small restaurants and bars. And we were saying that around 50 or 60 percent would not make it. And it seems that that's exactly what's happening. But what's interesting is what kinds of restaurants and bars are making it and which ones aren't. I want you to focus a little bit on that because that's very interesting. So I, I believe that the restaurants, it, well, first of all, no one's going to be able to sustain themselves for a very, very long term. So there, there needs, so there, there needs to be some level of opening. Um, however, there can't be any level of opening and, and we can't increase the level of opening until the number of cases get down, go down. So in my opinion, the, the places, the restaurants that are going to do well um, and the bars when they are able to open that are are going to do better than others are the ones that are willing to adapt um, and the ones that have the resources. So um, the neighborhood bars were probably not doing very well pre-pandemic. So um, they're really suffering now. So they're, they're close to closing if they haven't already closed. Those places that have um, kept up with the times, um, folks are looking are not just looking for a place to drink, to get drunk and to pick somebody up. They're, they're looking for an experience. And, and actually statistics show that the younger crowd are, are not drinking 
as much as they were in perhaps my generation. So the just going out and getting drunk is no longer a thing. There, there has to be something else to do. There has to be an experience. So places that are offering that experience, um, Fort Lauderdale isn't real big on those, but we have a few, you know, you have the ax throwing or the game rooms um, or the paint and sips. Um, so you're, you're doing something besides drinking, you're socializing. Um, I, I think they're going, they're going to do better with a pandemic or not without a pandemic. Um, the places that are, have said, okay, I've, I accept that there's a pandemic. I accept that I need to make some changes in my business model moving forward. They're going to do better than the places that are saying, you know what, I'm just going to wait until things get better and then just reopen what I've had for the last 20 years. Um, those places are, are not going to do as well in my, in my opinion. And no question, the folks who have been able to adapt in any business are seem to be doing better. And, and you know, people who thought this was only going to be a, a, exactly. a, a several week event, you know, were unfortunately misguided. Fortunately, the people who've been watching Zoom at noon had the, the, the advice to know that they were going to have to adapt or, or perish. And so we, we've had lots of folks who aren't even on today because they're, they're out doing their thing. And we used to have an hour long presentation. Now it's a half hour because people are, are in fact out trying to do stuff. The other folks, and I think you mentioned that, you said those who have the resources, in my opinion, are, you are going to see a lot more large chains uh, uh, and, and less fine dining like you talked about, and that those uh, large chains you know, have access to capital, they have access to SBAs, they have access to the Federal Reserve, uh, Main Street Loan Program, they, they have access to issue junk bonds that the Federal Reserve seems to be buying. Small businesses just don't have the ability, the resources, and access to that kind of stuff. It seems like the playing field is just remarkably unfair favoring really large gets larger, small perishes. What's your thought on that? Yeah, it's it's been heartbreaking and really unfortunate to hear this because that's exactly what's happening. Um, again, the small neighborhood bars, it's the owner who's also the manager, who's also the head bartender. And then he's got, he or she has a handful of, of loyal employees. Um, they don't, they might have somebody that you know, does their audit at the end of the year or, or pays their bills, but somebody to help navigate through that, the PPP paperwork, um, the SBA loans, they, they just don't have those resources. And so, yeah, it's, it's been, it has been unfair for them. They're at a, they're definitely at a disadvantage. We in fact represent a few small restaurants and, and have worked with their landlords and have worked with, uh, their bankruptcy counsel, and, and we, we've worked with, uh, with them going through the bankruptcy process. And to some extent, sometimes the answer is, and you and I talked about this, is for them to throw in the cards, get in the soup, file that bankruptcy, and then when, when, when the smoke clears, come out like a phoenix and, and reemerge stronger and better than, than before. And maybe something's just hanging on isn't necessarily the, the best answer. And that, that's, right. You know, and, and unfortunately, a, a lot of business owners don't necessarily have the business acumen to, to weather through this kind of storm. Um, I, I have a slide here and we don't have to go into detail, but it just shows the, the ventilation systems of indoor restaurants and why bars are so challenging and how it, 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 you know, the virus can spread in a small area based on the, on the ventilation system. Is the city of Fort Lauderdale looking at UV lighting as a requirement or trying to provide grants to folks so they can work on their ventilation systems or, or bring in more fresh air into the ventilation systems because, you know, it's interesting, airplanes, people are flying on airplanes, you know, they're not getting sick on airplanes because the airplanes bring in fresh air constantly, right. yet the nursing home and a cruise line doesn't do that. And so we're starting to see what kinds of indoor air are bad and what kinds of indoor air are not bad. But bars kind of are like nursing homes and cruise lines right now. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the city has not delved into that kind um, of detail. I, I feel like that's maybe a little bit crossing the line between right. the government getting involved in private enterprise. But the, the hospitality industry is has come out with some amazing um, protocols and best practices for this. And they're, in my mind, they're way ahead of anything a bunch of bureaucrats in the government could come up with. So it it's again it's a willingness to say okay this is the way it's going to be for a while so we need to adapt by doing this this and this 
And in a bar situation, like you said, it's particularly challenging. Um, and and, I, and the way I see it, bars are going to have to figure out how to put everybody in their place and have a place for everybody, um, like you do in a restaurant. So mingling is just not gonna happen for several months, for many months until we get a vaccine. We can't have situations where there is mingling. We can't have situations where you're leaning over a bar and congregating in a bar. So there, it's the bars almost need to be set up like restaurants or they do right. need to be set up like restaurants. Everybody has a table, everybody has a chair um, and everybody has a server. So that's, that's really gonna be the first step. The, well, that's probably the second step. The first step is, is being able to do more of this outdoors. So right. I think once the summer heat goes away and we're into fall, we're in October, November, December, and we can have more outdoor opportunities um, in controlled, contained areas, I think that's, that's going to be the first step. And, and the city is going to be very adaptive about closing streets and creating extensions for these restaurants for public space, I, I understand, right? I, I certainly hope so. We, we're doing it now to a limited degree. Um, on Las Olas, we've closed the lanes um, going one lane in either direction. And then um, when the beach has been closed, we've also closed down A1A. So that just Very allows fine. more ped pedestrian activity. Um, not We haven't had some so much an expansion of outdoor seating, although I hope that's where we head. But there's other ramifications to having more outdoor activity. You have uh, more, more noise. Um, you have uh, businesses occupying space that doesn't necessarily belong to them. So I hope that the city, we are able to come up with ways to maybe use parking spaces or, or parklets or even park space to accommodate some, some additional outdoor social activities when the numbers are where they need to be. So, so Sarah, we were talking about that right now, if we look at this chart, right now out in, indoor seating is at 50% for restaurants and previously it was 25, but you were telling me that the reality is most of these restaurants aren't even at 50% because the people aren't coming out. Is that, is that right? Yeah, realistically, it, since, since the July 4th weekend, it's, it's been pretty dismal. Um, yeah, they're allowed. They, we never were at 25%. We started right at 50% in Broward right. County. So, um, and at first that we were, it was going really well. And then the cases just went through the roof and July was just a horrible month for most of these restaurants. This is a cute picture I just wanted to show you about uh, the new, new way to social distance. Yes. And, uh, and then you, you turned me on to this. I know you found this, uh, you, you saw an article in Time Magazine about some new futuristic uh, types of outfits that people may, may wear. There's another picture too, if you go to the next one. Uh, and, and I just wanted to, <laughs> wanted to know your thoughts about, about these new partying outfits. Yeah, you know, it, it was an interesting, it's an interesting concept. Basically, it allows... Uh, folks to engage in nightclub and bar activity as they did pre-pandemic. So you're still able to get in each other's faces. You're still able to dance with one another. You're still able to mingle and socialize as you were before. Um, I honestly can't see anybody wearing this stuff, um, but you know, it's, a, it's an option. Right. I'm going to take one question and then we're going to have to call it quits, but here, uh, how can you police private parties? Is it legally enforceable, I guess, is the question. It, and that is really the, the tough question. So the county came out with rules about private parties in people's houses, but it is, it is not possible to enforce. So I mean, unless, unless it's a noise issue, unless it's a so noise well, issue. Yes, right? well, yes. So we have normal laws that govern um, activity but going into someone's home that's having a dinner party is, is probably not something that our law enforcement or code is going to do. And, and we, you know, we're just not a totalitarian society. And so I know the, those societies have done better with controlling this, but, but we will have to continue to, to balance our legal and constitutional rights with that of the greater good of society. And that's, that's the, gonna be the challenge. And, and it's remarkable that the city of Fort Lauderdale has someone like you, Sarah, that's trying to balance those two things. And I, I think it's wonderful that, that you're doing this and that you are, are a repository of, of this kind of, of, of 
conflict that, that, we're, that we're trying to deal with right now. On the one hand, trying to keep these places open, on the other hand, trying to keep the community safe. And I wish you well, I think it's an impossible job and I'm glad that you're doing it and not me. Uh, on that note, I wanna thank you, Sarah. I want to, this is Sarah Spurlock from the city of Fort Lauderdale in charge of nightlife at the city of Fort Lauderdale. Again, I wanna thank uh, the law firm, Oppenheim Law, our title company, Western Title. We're here, we're open, we're virtual, we're a hybrid model. We adapted immediately. And I encourage all of you who, who haven't done so to just get in the soup and, and, and just adapt because that is the only way we're gonna survive as a, as, as a, as a species. And so uh, I will see all of you next week at Zoom at noon. Sarah, thank you again. Thank and everyone you. have a great week. Zoom at noon, Roy Alpenheim. Thank you so much. Take care, Sarah. Bye-bye. All right, thanks.